Diane Schroeder, now Senior Vice President of HR, longtime ICANN employee. Diane, how did you first become involved with ICANN? In 2000, very early 2000, um, Louis Tuton, who was the first general counsel, had brunch with a friend of mine. We used to work together about six years before that. And um, he asked how I was doing, and I had my own business, and I had just had one of my um, larger clients um, relocate, and I was looking for something to replace about 15% of my revenue. And he said, well, do you think she'd come up 10 hours a week and help me set up the office? And I'm still there. Diane, what was it like in those early days? There weren't a lot of people around. Um, at the time that I came on board, um, there were really only five people, um, the CEO, um, the general counsel, and uh, the first policy person, who was also the CFO, because in those days, um, you had to have three different people as officers in the state of California, and there were only three of them except for the receptionist. So our first policy officer was our CFO at that point. Um, and um, it was uh, a small suite that we were subleasing from USC. The early that work... That was a USC building in Marina Del Rey, In right? Marina Del Rey. The early work that was done on this was all done by John Postel's staff. And so when we started up, they continued to do the work on a loan to ICANN um, until we could get funding. And then as we got funding, we hired people and we sent John Postel's staff back to USC. So Suzanne Wolf was one of them, John um, Postel was one of them. Um, there were a couple of other people who did things behind the scenes up in, at the uh, USC offices. Um, so we started in this small little corner and every time we needed space for quite a long time, actually more than 10 years, um, USC gave us another little chunk of space somewhere. Um, and uh, that's how we grew and eventually um, uh, started bringing people on as the funding came in. You mentioned funding. How tight was money? Well, when I started, um, we had $75,000 in the bank. And uh, part of what I was asked to do was set up a financial system because it was being run off a spreadsheet by Mike Roberts, the first uh, CEO. Um, and. Uh, the very first thing I was asked to do, I was asked to build the test bed registrars uh, for their very first invoices, but I had no clue what a test bed registrar was. It was like total Greek to me. And um, that was actually the very first invoices that went out that came in with a funding for us came from that. And then as uh, the registries um, contracts had been executed, we started invoicing them. We operated really the first two years off of four large corporate loans that we were given. Um, and we um, paid two of them back at the end of the first year and two of them were extended into a second year. And by that point then we had enough funding coming on a regular basis from the registrars and the registries as well as um, some donations from country codes and the RIRs. Um, that we were able to repay those and, and fund on our own. Were there ever times in those early days where you thought, you know what, we're not going to make it? Not as an organization as a whole. Not make payroll, yes, um, because the cash flow wasn't steady because of uh, the donation aspect of it and the timing between um, uh, quarterly registrar billings and, you know, every other week payrolls. There were a couple of times with payrolls that I was working the phones going, hi, you told me you were going to send a check. When's the check coming? Um, and in fact, my very first international meeting was uh, Melbourne in 2001. And I got on the plane and this man sat down next to me and said, are you going to the ICANN meeting? Because most of the people on the plane appeared to be. Um, and I said, yes. And he said, my name's Bruce Beckwith. And I burst out laughing because Bruce was with um, NSI in those days, who was the largest registrar. And I said, you're going to love this. I'm Diane Schroeder. I'm the woman that calls and bugs you about money all the time. I can do that all the way to Australia. <laughs> so he was very nice. We, we struck up a friendship right there and then. But it was just, you know, <laughs> to me, he was one of those people I needed to get the checks in from. 
So aside from money, what were the biggest problems that you were facing? Too much work and not enough people, which you know we still face, but in those days, um, when you had a very, very small staff, you did everything. I mean, Louis was our, our webmaster, our general counsel, ran our phone system. Um, you know, I basically ran the meetings, um, ran HR, and ran finance for three or four years all at the same time until we really had enough funding in um, to kind of go to the next level. Um, that was probably our biggest problem. A lot of time just trying to establish legitimacy and being challenged by people that didn't really want to see us succeed um, because they had their own agendas in the space, whether it be um, someone like VeriSign who um, saw us in those days as a big threat or the civil society groups who did not see us as um, uh, the, the path they wanted to see taken. Um, people in public forums who were very, very contentious about a lot of the issues in the early days. So there was always this, this um, constant criticism in the early days. So it sounds like what you're saying is that the very legitimacy of ICANN wasn't there from day one. No. It grew. It grew. Absolutely not. And um, it really took a long time. Um, and in some ways, it's still one of those things that we struggle with because we're such a unique organization and have such a unique niche. Going through the transition period, there were definitely people who questioned the legitimacy at that point. And, um, still but usually because of their agendas, not because of what ICANN itself was doing. How much of a uh, hassle was it? And how much were people scrambling in the context of the very sudden and unexpected death of John Postel? Well, he died before I came. So I don't have as much context about that. Um, um, the piece that I know in the early days, we did get a lot of people who um, purported to speak for what John would have done. Oh, John would not have done it that way. Oh, you can't. Um, I know one of the early conversations was when John Crane joined us was about his title because John Postel... John Crane, now one of our security people. Correct. John Postel would have carried the CTO title, as I understand it, and they proposed to give that to Crane, and people were like, oh, no, nobody can have that. That would have been John's title. So there was some of that type of um, talk around John Postel when I came on board, but I don't really know how they dealt with the, the other question. Was there a point, Diane, or maybe there wasn't, maybe it was just a gradual sort of thing, was there a point where you thought the ball's rolling? We now have, our, we have a funding model figured out. Um, we're bound to grow. Mm -hmm. Was there such a point? So I think one of the turning points for me in um, understanding and seeing the future was when Stuart Lynn, who was our second CEO, um, proposed pretty much out of the blue and on his own initiative um, that I can do what they called evolution and reform at that time. And that was in um, 2002. Um, he presented a plan to the community about, okay, we've tried it for a little while and we need to reorganize. And that was when we moved um, some things like, it went from the DNSO to the GNSO, and it went from being an outside organization to one that was supported in-house, um, where we really got the, the basic structure that we're in today. Um, I think the fact that it didn't, um, uh, make us fail as an organization because you, when you talk about changing what you're doing, you open the door to people who want to take it apart, right? But instead, it reformed in a way that actually led us down the paths we're at today to where we've gotten to. So I think that was one big turning point. But this isn't just a regular startup. This is an organization whose primary role was the organization coordination of the Internet's addressing system. Correct. But there were people out there who wanted to see that done differently. Um, and, you know, mostly because they had a commercial interest um, that they wanted to see succeed. Uh, or, you know, sometimes they had a personal agenda with believing that tech should be done a different way that we were doing the addressing. Um, and. I really think that with what Stuart did at that point was a big risk for the organization because if you open the door and you go out into community consultation, 
to agree upon what your new format should be, it's just as easy to say, no format, you, you shouldn't be here. Um, but it really did, I think it, it cemented us through the next period. Shortly after that, when Paul Toomey joined, then he proposed the new funding model that took us from the three to five million dollar um, type of a budget up to 15 and then up to 25. And that's really when we were starting to be able to resource well, to be able to support the work that we were trying to do. How much concern was there internally about the U.S. government specifically and all other governments generally? I don't think it was concern as much as it was trying to um, uh, have people on both sides understand what an appropriate role would be for them. With um, governments, they kind of want all or nothing. That's what they're used to. And with um, a lot of the people involved on the, either the commercial side or the civil society uh, registrant side of things, they didn't want government interference in it. And so I, the, the whole subject of the GAC and their role in it was pretty contentious with a lot of the um, various groups in the early stages. The fact that in the bylaws it has the uh, provision about GAC advice needing to be accepted by the board sounded a little bit to people like, well, the government's having it. Governments are used by, by their very nature. They're used to having the final exactly. word. They're used to being the voice. All of a sudden in ICANN, they are a voice, voice, but not the only voice. Correct. Well, in the early days, just writing the GAC communique um, used to take hours. In Bucharest, um, the GAC communique went until like two in the morning one night as because you're having all of these individuals, even though it was a much smaller group at that point, who um, have to agree upon what the language and something is like. And that's very unique in the government world. You know, you have the United Nations where they each have a vote, but they don't come out with one document in the end. So to have any group of governments, all of whom have um, different needs and represent different um, constituencies, so to speak, come together and issue one statement is something I don't think you see anywhere else. Well, you're hitting on an area that I was wondering about because the multi-stakeholder model is such a weird, funky creature. I mean, right. it's just not well understood yeah. by anybody who's not participated in it. Mm -hmm. What kind of task was it to to convey understanding of this unique model to not just governments, but everyone else? Well, I really think that, that we still struggle with that. Um, I think that it's something that we take a little bit for granted, the people that work with it all the time, not just within ICANN, but within the constituencies, about how strange it appears to people outside the world. And I think that um, I, I saw a chat in passing this morning from some of the conversations at the GAC today where somebody's comment was we need to do a better job of educating um, some of the newer GAC members on what it is that we really do. You have governments in particular where the people that come to the meetings um, will change as governments change. Um, you don't necessarily have the same person representing a country for a long period of time and you may get a minister one time and you may get a lower level person the next time and they may have a complete different understanding of what the multi-stakeholder model is and what you actually can do within it without the consultations that go on. So I think we still struggle a bit with how we explain it clearly um, from the perspective of the person looking into it um, because that perspective is very different among the various groups. You know, there are some people who honestly believe we're just here to make the money. Um, and then there are a whole lot of people that have a much different, you have the, the people that have the mission of keeping the internet open and keeping it stable. And so you have that tension there, the governments, the control, the money, and then the people with really the passion for the Quite a mission. mishmash of interests. Yeah. What was, a two part question. What was the, greatest challenge in the early days? You mentioned the funding, perhaps it was that, perhaps it was something else. And fast forward to today, and what is the greatest challenge for the organization today? I think in the beginning it was not getting distracted by all of the forces that were really kind of trying to bring us down um, as an organization and trying to um, take away any of the legitimacy that we had established because it, we would 
get attacked, so to speak, on multiple forces. There were um, uh, various players in that world who were funding people behind the scenes um, that weren't obvious. Um, some of the um, user groups in the early days had members that had been funded by some of the commercial interests um, to come and um, really raise questions on, from all angles about ICANN and what you're doing. Um, it, today, I think it is trying to be too many things to too many people. We only have so many resources. We only have so many, um, uh, so much bandwidth mentally. So as we get into this age where things are very, very uh, complex in the world, and you and you just take the the data privacy issues alone, um, that can really absorb a lot of time and resources dealing with that. At the same time, we're looking at people who want the next round of the new GTLDs to come out. We're doing the KSK rollover. You've got all of these various pieces. And how do you prioritize it so that your resources are really um, at helping you to get to the best end results? So what I'm hearing you say is, is it sounds like sometimes we need to learn how to say no. Need to learn how to say no, or we need to learn how to make the the uh, participants in the multi-stakeholder model understand that they may have a really good point and um, a useful point of view, but that isn't something we can necessarily tackle today. Let me ask you, let's, let's talk about you personally. Mm -hmm. 20 years you've been there. 17. Okay. Seen an amazing transition in the organization. Six CEOs. Six CEOs. Mm -hmm. Why are you still there? The people. That, that's easily the very first thing, and I am never bored. So anytime I've been at that point where you get in a job and you think, mm, it's time to get something else because I'm getting a little too comfortable, and um, I can't have offered me that opportunity because the organization has evolved. Um, and so I you know, uh, supported the board for four years. Um, I wanted to change my pace. That, that was a very... Um, challenging role time-wise. You've got board members all over the world, you've got committee meetings at 4 a.m. in the morning where my time and I was getting older and I wanted to cut my pace back. So I looked around and there was an opening in the organization so I stayed with the organization. Every time I've needed to do that I've been lucky enough that there's been something at ICANN that has fit my needs as well as me fitting the organization's needs. But the real thing is the people. I've met the most fascinating, smart, nice people through this whole process. I've met, you know, I'm a milkman's daughter, my mom worked in retail, and I've met the president of Estonia and the president of Uruguay and Bill Clinton. Who thought? Um, I've met people who um, do this out of passion. Um, I've met people who do, you know, who are uh, uh, multimillionaires because of the businesses that they built around it and there's really not much difference in distinction between them we're really fairly classless as an organization and that really appeals to me and people have a lot of passion about it for better or for worse sometimes let me ask you a softball as a senior VP of HR yep is the organization as committed to the people as Diane Schroeder herself is Oh, I absolutely believe it. And I think it's one reason that um, we continue to be a fairly successful organization people-wise, is that even if people don't really understand what we do when they come in, um, the passion that we have, as well as the commitment of the organization to people in general. Um, we, as we developed over the years as an organization, most of our funding went to our outside work. If you didn't do the outside work well, you didn't need an inside structure. So you did, we didn't build up HR, finance, IT. When we got to the point where um, Fadi joined us and we doubled in size in 18 months and we went from about 130 to 260 staff, it broke. It broke that foundation that didn't exist. But Fadi had the foresight to say, okay, I need to give you the resources. Uh, and he did. He funded, HR went from four people to, I have 15 now. Um, finance the same, IT the same. 
Um, by doing that, he showed a commitment to people. Um, Yarn has the same commitment to people. Um, our people come first, we try to do what we can to help. I really truly believe we are an ICANN family. And we've been able to keep that feeling no matter how spread out and diverse we are. And it's one of the things that people um, really focus on. I can't tell you why we've been successful at doing it, but we don't want to lose that aspect of it as we um, do the work that we have to do and the work changes. Ira Magaziner, the Clinton administration official who arguably could be considered the father of ICANN, mm -hmm. when I posed the question to Magaziner about what do you see as the, the greatest risk to ICANN moving forward, he said something to the effect of if ICANN becomes very self-impressed or if it becomes too bureaucratic and too big, what do you think about that? Oh, I think that's definitely true. I mean, I feel very much like if we lose the passion, um, which is what I think you do if you become that type of an organization, I think that um, you will lose a lot of the committed staff. Um, it's a very hard job. Um, and it, it's a very hard job at any level that you have. It's very fast-paced. Um, it's very diverse. So you have to be thinking about a lot of aspects at any given time. Um, it's um, a lot of different agendas coming in, and you have to try to balance those. And you have to really be able to see the big picture. Um, and there are people that don't fit well with the organization. They will come in and they will find that it's just not for them. Um, and I admire the fact that sometimes they identify that early enough on. And there's sometimes that they're lost for a little bit. And usually either through mentoring in the department or you know getting involved with um, somebody in one of the other departments, they start to see where they fit into the picture. Um, and I hope that will keep us from doing that. We do have to find a way, however, to um, balance the tremendous pressure to be everything to everybody against limited resources and um, people who need to have lives, so to speak. It, it isn't the organization that it was when I joined when you had to do everything 24-7. Um, and I think that we're still struggling how to find that balance. Very good. Diane Schroeder, one of the first employees of ICANN, thank you very much for taking the time. You're welcome, Brad.